Okay, so uh, hello and welcome everyone to this session on reactive streams with Monix. Uh, my name is Jacek Kunicki, I work at Software Mill. Uh, we're a consultancy based in Poland. Uh, we write code, as everyone here does probably, but to, there are two things that are specific about us. So we are fully remote and we are fully flat, uh, which is a bit unique, especially there in Poland. Uh, if you want to learn how such an organization works internally, feel free to ask questions. And today we're going to talk about processing reactive streams with Monix. So like every session here, I'm going to start with a reactive streams 101. Uh, everyone in this track has their own introduction, so I don't want to be worse. Uh, so in a stream processing, processing pipeline, you basically have some source of your data. You can call it a producer. You have a destination for your data, which you can call a consumer. And you have a number of stages in the middle that do something with your data. So they process your data. And of course, you have data flowing from left to right, from the producer through the stages to the consumer. Uh, now, if you think about such a pipeline and if you think uh, about what can go wrong here, uh, some problems may arise when the, when the consuming parties are slower than the producing ones, because then you have some excess data and you have to deal with, with it somehow. So there are, of course, several ways to do it. Uh, the first one that you may think of is perhaps dropping the excess data. And that's actually something that happens quite often, for example, in networking hardware. So this is not something really uncommon. Uh, another way to, to do it is to just block. So the slower party can block and not accept any data, j just, just block when processing the data, and when it's done, it can process the next chunk. Uh, what you can also do is to buffer. Uh, so for, for example, the slower consumer can allocate a buffer for the data that's coming from the producer. But then the problem with buffers is that they, they are limited. So they, they, they have limited capacity and sooner or later, if, if the producer is really fast, you end up with an out of memory error. So buffering, only buffering is also not the way to go. Now, the way that this problem is solved in reactive streams uh, is uh, using something called back pressure. And back pressure is basically a way for a slower consumer uh, to tell the producer how much data it can accept. So if, you, if, if, if we have the data, the, the blue arrows here flowing from the producer to the consumer, you can imagine the back pressure as, uh, an, as data flowing in the opposite direction uh, with the, the consumer basically requesting data to process from the producer. And then what is important about back pressure in reactive streams uh, that is that it's asynchronous. So generally in reactive processing, we want to be as asynchronous and as non-blocking as possible because if there are any resources we are not using at the moment, we should uh, pull them, put them back into some kind of pool so that uh, they can be reused by, by other components. And the same applies to back pressure. So it's not only important that we have back pressure, but it's crucial that the back pressure itself is asynchronous and non-blocking. Now, every implementation of reactive streams, because there are plenty of them, has uh, its own terminology for, for those stages here. Uh, so this is a general one. Monix, the library we will be covering today, has its own. Uh, and so the producer in Monix is called an observable. So this is the source for our data. Uh, the consumer, well, is called the consumer. So this is pretty straightforward. And the stages in the middle are, co are, are called transformers. So that, th those are the blocks that are actually processing our data. So this is for the introduction to reactive streams. Uh, and now, what is Monix? Uh, did any one of you hear about Monix before? Okay, more people than I, than I expected. So Monix is basically a library, it describes itself as a library for asynchronous processing and even driven processing. Uh, it offers a couple of abstractions. The first one is a task. So task is basically a, present, a representation of an asynchronous computation. Uh, it's, it's something like a Scala future, but a better one because uh, a future in, in Scala is eager, so when you create a new future, it's executed immediately, and you don't actually have any control of when it's executed. But in, uh, in Monix task, on the contrary, you have a full control because it, it's lazy, so you define, uh, just define a description of a computation, an asynchronous one that you want to perform, but it's not executed until you explicitly uh, run the task. Uh, another interesting thing that Monix offers is something called coeval. And coeval is basically something like a, like a lazy val in Scala or like a by name parameter in, 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 a, in a Scala method. 
uh, but it's lifted to a type level. So basically you have a type to represent a lazy computation, but this time it's an immediate lazy computation. And uh, the benefits uh, from, from the fact that, uh, that it's represented by a type is, for example, that uh, you, you, you can also include some, er some error handling, so you can, you can then pattern match on the result of a coeval. So this, this, this really behaves like a lazy val or by name parameter, but you have a type that represents it and you have some benefits of this being represented by an actual type. And of course we have observables, and that's what we will be looking at today. Observables are the, are the monics abstraction for reactive programming. So I want to sh show you a use case. Uh, if any one of you attended uh, my talk last year, which covered ACCA streams, this is going to be the same example, but with a different library. Uh, so the example we're going to use is uh, some input data in gzip CSV files. And basically uh, the, the data looks like uh, we have IDs and we have values. So we have two, value, two, two lines for each ID. And then we want to process those values uh, by, by, by the given IDs. So we want to take two values for each ID, then average them, if it's possible, because it may not be possible since some of the values may be invalid, as you can see in the example. And then after averaging it, we're going to store it into some database. Here is going to be Cassandra. Okay, so let's then jump to the code and see how Monix can, uh, can he help us solve this problem. So we start with, a, uh, with an empty class with some configuration parameters that we are going to use later. And the first thing we're going to define is, uh, is, is not yet a transformer, so not, not, uh, not a Monix building block yet but it's going to be just a method for uh, a utility method for parsing our, uh, our, our lines from the CSV file. So we're going to call it parse line. It's going to take a line that is a string and is going to, is going to be a, an asynchronous computation. So in Monix, uh, we represent an asynchronous computation by a task. Uh, so it's a task of reading. And reading is actually a part of our domain model. The, this is a sealed trait that provides an ID. And we have two, two, two implementations. First one is a valid reading that has an ID and also has a value. But we are also representing in our domain an invalid reading, which only has an ID. That's uh, going to make computing the average easier and uh, handling invalid values easier. Uh, so we have a method that, uh, that returns a task of reading. So you, to create a task, you just use task apply. This is very similar to how you use a future in Scala. Uh, here is some boilerplate for parsing the line from a CSV file. So we just split by the semicolon and that's, that's pretty much it. But this is the happy path. So if everyone went fine, we're returning a valid reading with an ID and a value. Uh, but actually we want to handle, uh, handle errors here as well, because as you remember from the slide, some of the values can be invalid. Uh, so let's just use a try here. We'll be catching a throwable, and then we want to do two things. Uh, we want to log the line so that we know in, our, in the output of our app that something, uh, something went wrong. And here we're going to return an invalid reading with just an, with just an ID. So that's why we wanted to represent an invalid reading as well in our domain model. Uh, so that we can return it here and have, a, have, an, have an observable of readings, be them valid or invalid. So, so far this really doesn't have to do a lot with Monix. The only thing that is from Monix here is, is a task. Now we are going to actually use the, the observables and to implement the building blocks of our stream processing pipeline, which are going to be the transformers, as you remember. So the first transformer uh, is going to parse the file. So it's going to take a file and from, from every file it's going to emit, uh, emit readings so you uh, uh, obtained using this parse line method. Uh, so now we are defining the transformers as values. Those are just uh, descriptions of what we want to do. They are not, not doing anything until actually executed. So the parse file is going to be a transformer. And actually, as you can see, transformer in Monix is nothing more than a function that converts an observable of type A to an observable of type B. Uh, so this transformer is going to take a file, the Java I.O. file, and transform it to a reading. So the input will be an observable of files and the output will be an observable of readings. 
So we're starting with an observable of file here. And actually what we want to do, uh, we, want to, we want to take the file, uh, read the lines from the file, uh, and then we're going to end up with an observable of, line, of, of readings because we would parse them to readings. So having multiple files, we're going to, to, to have multiple observables. Uh, and so what we want to do with the, to, we want to flatten the observable to have a single observable of readings. So starting with the observables files, we will be mapping it to an observable of readings and then flattening it. So when we think of mapping and flattening, we probably think of flat map. And now in, in the, inside this flat map, we're going to define the logic to process a single file. So the first thing we need to do is create a reader of, because we won't be reading the entire file into memory. We want a reader that reads the gzipped file into an, as a, yeah, in, in a streaming fashion. So there is some boilerplate to create a reader using all the, all the Java wrappers. But eventually we, we start from a file input stream and then unzip it and end with the buffer reader. The reason we did it is that we have a factory method in the observable uh, called from lines reader that takes a buffered reader. And now what we want to do here is to, to do some processing with the observable. The first thing we may want to do is uh, drop some lines from the, from, the, from the beginning because, for example, we can have a line with, uh, with, with headers with the, the name, names of the columns. Uh, so we can drop an arbitrary number of elements. We have a config parameter for that called lines to skip. And then we want to uh, execute the actual conversion from a string, from a line to a reading to our domain model with the parse line method we defined previously. Uh, for this, we're going to use the map task method, which basically takes a description of an async computation that is going to be performed. So we, we, we have a method that actually takes a string and returns the task of reading. So that's what we want. So we're using it here. So once again, what we did here is we took an observable of files and then for every file, we, t we converted it into an observable of readings. So we ended up with a number of observables of reading and then we wanted to flatten them into a single observable of reading. That's why we use the flat map method here. So the next step after parsing the file is actually computing the average. So this is going to be another transformer. Sorry. Uh, so this is a transformer from a reading because our previous transformer returned a reading to a valid reading because after computing the average, we want to end up with something that can be stored to a database. And in our database table, we have, we have two columns, ID and the value. So inside this average computation, we are going to handle the invalid values somehow in order to always return a valid reading that can be stored uh, into the database. So here, starting with an observable of reading, what we want to do uh, is, take, is, is group the readings in groups of two. And then for every pair of readings, uh, which will be sharing the same ID, we want to compute the average. So to group the readings into groups of two, we are going to use a buffer tumbling method, which basically takes the observable and groups it and emits the groups downstream. So the group size is going to be two. And now we're going to use map async because we want to do all the processing, all the average computation asynchronously. So map async, as you can see, uh, takes two parameters. First is the parallelism level, and the second one is the actual computation. So the parallelism level is the number of computations that we want to be executed in parallel. And we have a config parameter for uh, parallel in-memory operations called non-IO parallelism. And here we are going to end up with a collection of readings of size two that we want to process. And since, since this is map async and since this is going to be an async computation, uh, we are doing it inside the task. Uh, and now what we want to do is uh, first, well, to compute the average, we'll be, extra, we'll be trying to extract the valid readings. And then if, if there are any valid readings, we'll be just summing them and dividing by, by two or by the size. Uh, and if there is no valid reading in the pair, we just return a dummy value of minus one for the average. So let's start with ex uh, extracting the valid readings. And for this, we just do readings collect uh, pattern match on valid readings. 
uh, and that's pretty much it. Sorry, this is not necessary. Yeah, then we are computing the average. And to compute the average, we basically check if the valid readings are non -em or not empty. Uh, if so, uh, we are taking the, the values of those and summing them. And dividing by the size of valid readings. Otherwise, we're just returning minus one as a dummy value for our average. And the last thing we need to do here is to return a domain representation of, of the reading, so it's going to be a valid reading. And now we need an ID, uh, and since we're representing invalid readings in our domain model as well, we are always going to have an ID. So we are just safe to take first of the readings and take its ID. And then take the average we computed to, to use as the value. So once again, what we did here in this transformer, in this stage, is we took the observable of readings, valid or invalid, grouped them in groups of two, and then for every, for every group of size two, we defined an async computation with the task uh, that is going to try to compute an average, and if there is nothing to com compute the average from, it's just going to use dummy value of minus one. And now actually if you, if you think about uh, defining a building blocks for your processing pipeline and uh, you may also think about a way to combine them so that you want to use some smaller building blocks combined into a bigger one that can be reused later. And actually we, we can also do something like that here. So let's write another transformer called process single file, which is going to be a transformer from uh, from a file to a valid reading. And the, this uh, would do nothing more than just combine the two, pre two previous ones that we implemented. So it's just going to take then an observable of files, then call transform to apply another transformer. Uh, this is going to use the parse file. And then we're going to use the other one, the average computing computation, also calling transform. So this is a pretty simple way to, it's actually just combining functions, but you have, you have the transform operator on the observable, and you can take multiple uh, building blocks uh, that describe a, a, a transformer for your stream and combine them into a single one. So now, uh, if you remember what the processing pipeline looks like, we have a source of data, we have a destination, and we have something in the middle to process. So what we have implemented so far is this something in the middle, so now we need a source and a destination. So we'll start from the end, from the destination. It's going to be called stored readings, store readings. And now this is not going to be a transformer anymore because this is the end of our pipeline, so it's going to be the consumer. It's going to take valid readings, so the output of our compute average step. And the, the return type would be unit, which means that we basically don't care about the, the result. We only care about the fact that it, uh, it has been executed and that it has finished successfully. And for, for the consumer, we have a useful, uh, useful factory method that would uh, enable us to do the entire processing in parallel, so to store all the data into, into Cassandra in parallel. This is called for each parallel async. And it takes two parameters, it takes the parallelism level and the description of the computation that we want to actually, actually use. So for the parallelism, we have another configuration parameter called concurrent writes. This is a different value than the parallelism used for in-memory computations. And for storing the value into the database, we have some reading repository that exposes a safe method. And the only thing you need to know about it is that it, uh, it has a signature that uh, it is useful for us because it takes, a, it takes a valid reading and returns a task of units. So this is some async computation that would consume our, our valid reading, store it, and uh, return a task of unit as a description of this computation. So now having all, almost all the building blocks, like the, the processing uh, blocks themselves, and then the destination for our data, we're going to assemble the entire pipeline. Uh, so now we're just writing a method that will be, will be executing in our application. It's going to be called import from files. 
And uh, now we're going back from the Monix world to the Scala world, so we'll be returning a future of unit here, which means that we're doing something asynchronously and we don't care about the result, but only about the completion. So now uh, to, st to start our pipeline, we need the files that we want to process. Uh, so we have a config parameter with the, with the directory where the files live. Uh, we, can, we can just list the files and that would be our starting point. Uh, we'll, we'll do some logging to, to see what's happening in, in the output of our application. Uh, we're going to record the start time so that we know how fast that is. And now we are ready to build the actual pipeline. So we're, we're starting with an observable. And since we, since we have a collection of files that we want to start with, we're using observable from iterable and just use the files here. Now we want to transform them. Uh, using the transformer that combines our two processing stages. Uh, so the process single file one. And we want to attach our consumer using consume with. And this is the store reading. It should be store readings actually. Yeah, now we can see that there is something in red here. And actually it says that we, we have a task of unit here and we want a future of unit. So the pipeline we built so far, is it, it, it doesn't execute at the moment. It doesn't do anything because we need to execute it to, so, so that it actually does something. And only then we will receive the future that represents the, the, the running computation. So to, to run it and to convert it into a future, we have a run async. Uh, there is some implicit missing here. I'll cover that in a moment. And actually, we have some, some useful callbacks as well on the, on, 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 the, on the pipeline so that we can observe whether it has completed successfully or with an error. Uh, so when it completes successfully, we, we can use uh, do on finish for that. We can, for example, compute the, the elapsed time and do some logging. Uh, and when it uh, completed with an error, oh, sorry. We also have an on, on error handle callback, to, we, which we can use to do some error handling, like logging, for example. So now we need some boilerplate to, to actually run it. Uh, this doesn't do anything more than just loading the configuration for our config parameters, initializing the repository, and uh, basically running our import from files method, the one here. And this is what we, do, we just created. Uh, and then it does some cleanup uh, in the end. So here you can also see that we have some, some missing implicit. Uh, so let's uh, now get back to, to SBT and try to <coughs> compile it. And you can see that we are missing two things. The first one is a, is a scheduler and the second one is an execution context here. Uh, actually, both of those boil down to the same thing, uh, which is uh, some kind of a thread pool that will be used to, compute, to, to perform our computations. Because in Scala, you need to be explicit about the, 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 the thread pool or the, like the, the resources that you are going to use for the async computations. And it's also a good idea to think carefully about uh, what threads are you going to use for, for example, not to, not to run the, uh, the I.O. operations and the in-memory operations on the same threads because the I.O. operations can be slower and we don't want the slower I.O. operations to block the faster in-memory operations. So usually you separate thread pools for this kind of operations and use different ones. Uh, and uh, Scala, actually here the compiler requires you to provide a specific thread pool, which is a nice thing. And for the sake of this example, we're not going to, to separate the thread pools. We're actually going to use a single one, the default one, because we just want uh, it to compile and to run. Uh, and actually, the good thing for us is that the Monix scheduler is also an execution context. So we can just take the default Monix scheduler and use it both as, the, as a scheduler in Monix and as the execution context for the Scala future. But this is something you really shouldn't be doing in production, but like op op optimizing is not the, not, not the main topic of this talk, so I'm just going to do something very, very unsafe here and use the default, uh, default execution context or the default scheduler. So we take the global one, which is something like the global execution context in Scala, but please also be aware of, uh, of what, which execution context you are using. So now it compiles just fine. 
so let's let's see inspect our our Cassandra table. So it's empty at the moment. Uh, so we're going to run our application and see what happens. So you can see some errors that uh, that tell us that some of the lines are actually invalid. Uh, you can see that the import was actually finished. So we can check if there is something in our database. And yeah, that's it. So looks like it worked. But if we come back uh, to our code for a second, uh, we can wonder, uh, because here, while computing the average, we're, uh, we're performing an async computation. So we are, we are doing all the, all, all the average computation asynchronously. But here, when parsing the lines, we're actually going, uh, not, not, not going in parallel. So, sorry, map async is not about, well, it's, it's about asynchronous, but it's also about doing things in parallel. So here are, we are computing the averages in parallel, but we are not parsing the lines in parallel. And perhaps we could also do it. But unfortunately, Monix doesn't expose a built-in uh, method for that. And the difference between these two places is uh, that here, we don't actually care about the order because we are taking the, we already have the groups of two readings. We can, we can process them in any order and emit them downstream in any order because does, this doesn't really matter. But here, on the contrary, uh, we want to process the lines one after another and we want to keep the order while emitting downstream because the lines are sharing the IDs. So if we mix them, we won't, uh, we won't have the same IDs next to each other. And that's actually what the average computation step requires from us. So here we, we actually want, would like to have something like map async ordered. So a map async method that uh, executes things uh, asynchronously and in parallel under the hood, but uh, keep tracks the order of things in which they are processed and uh, emits them downstream in the same order. This is uh, of course going to be a bit slower than the unordered variant because it needs to wait for, the, for some of the slower computations before the, the other ones can be emitted downstream but it may still be quicker than just processing them one after another. So since there is nothing built in in Monix, let's try to implement our map async order ourselves. So we're going to call it map async ordered. It's going to take two parameters, A and B, because basically we are converting between two observables. So what we are writing here is actually a transformer from A to B. So from an observable of type A to an observable of type B. And the signature is similar to map async. So the first parameter is the parallelism level, which is an int. And the other is the description of the async computation we want to perform, uh, which takes a value of type A and returns a task of B. So it's an async computation that converts between A and B. And the return type of this is going to be a transformer between A and B. So to do it, starting with an observable of A, uh, what we want to do first is convert, the, uh, is convert the values that are arriving to tasks, so to the representations of the computation that we actually want to perform. Uh, so we're going to call map f here, which takes, takes the value of type A and returns a task of B. So now we, are, we have an observable of tasks of B. Uh, the next step is actually to group the computations in uh, using the given parallelism level. So for grouping, you already know that we are using buffer tumbling. But here the, the parallelism level is determined by the parameter that we have here. And now we end up with, uh, with, with, with groups of observables of task of B, and we want to, 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 to execute them, to execute the actual tasks, and then emit a flattened, uh, a flattened observable downstream. So we want to uh, end up with an observable of B. So th this, this is a bit similar of, uh, with uh, what we did uh, when, when processing, uh, processing files. So we're basically using, using flatmap to combine several observables into one. And here what we want to do with the task is actually execute all of them and wait, wait until they are completed. And for this, we have a utility method in Monix called task gather. And this is, this is a variant of, uh, of, of like executing the task and waiting uh, until they complete. Uh, there are actually, an, there's a number of variants that, that you can do it because you can, uh, you can use task gather, task sequence and uh, 
I don't remember the third one. But basically, it's, 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 the, it's the matter of what, what order you want to keep. And actually, task gather uh, keeps the order of the results, but it may not keep the order of side effects. So if, if there were any side effects in our task, the order of the side effects would not, may, may not be maintained, but the order of results would be maintained. And the other one are either stricter or less strict. So the, the, the strictest one maintains both the order both of the side effects and, uh, and the results. And the less strict one doesn't, doesn't care about the order at all. So here we are somewhere, somewhere in the middle. And now we just want an observable of uh, type B here. So we're going to create an observable from the gathered task because gathered, the type of gathered is, uh, is actually a task of sequence of B. So it's a single task that, uh, that, that represents all the, all, all, that has all the results inside. So we'll start with an observable from task gathered. Uh, and then uh, we actually have, uh, we have an observable of sequence of B, but we want to, and, and to have an observable of B. So what we need to do here is to flatten this observable. And to flatten this, uh, you already know that we are using flat map, and we need a function that takes a sequence of B and converts it into an observable of B. And there is a helper method for that called observable from iterable. So once again, what we did here, we, we took the observable with the values of type A, then converted them to tasks with the map, map of F. Uh, then we used buffer tumbling to group the tasks into bigger groups. And then inside flat map, we used, we used task gather to execute all the tasks and to, to, to collect a, convert a sequence of tasks to a task containing the sequence of results, which is the gathered here. And then we converted it to an observable of type B. And now we just may want to add some syntax sugar that, so, so that we have a method available to, 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 run the, to, to run map async ordered on the observable. Uh, I'm running out of time, so, uh, so I'm not going to write it uh, by hand. I have a snippet for that. And this is basically the, the pimp, pimp my library method. So you have an implicit class, which is basically a way of adding a method to an existing type. So what we are doing here is uh, adding, uh, adding a map async ordered method to any observable of type A. And inside the, inside the method that we added, we are actually using the method we implemented right before to, to do the conversion. And here the method, this is a, met, a new method on the observable that uh, ty of type A that returns an observable of type B. So that's what we actually want to use here. Yeah, and now we just need to, we, we have, uh, this is method like any other on the observable. Uh, so we provide the parallelism level, the non-IO parallelism, and the, and the call to our method, the parse line. We can try to run it to see what happens. Uh, I'll clear the database first. Yeah, so now there, it, it is still three something seconds, so we, it, it's not clear whether it's faster or not. And maybe the data set is too small, but this is, this is like a starting point to, to think uh, whether parallelizing is always the good way to go. So you, you actually should always compare the numbers and see whether, because parallelizing uh, requires res additional resources, it re may require context switching and stuff like that. Uh, so it's, it's not always faster, so you actually always need to think whether actually parallelizing is the way to go or you sh should you just go sequentially. So this is for the code. Uh, there are of course some more things to Monix. And there are some built-in consumers, apart from the one that we used here. Uh, Monix supports multicasting, so attaching multiple consumers to a single observable. Uh, there is an extensive docs, and actually I've been using Monix 2 point something here, but Monix 3 is right uh, ju just around the corner. Uh, it's, it's like uh, release candidate 2, I think, so uh, they will be releasing it shortly. And actually, it, it has some new stuff, but not, not really when it comes to observables. Like the reactive support doesn't, did, didn't change much in 3.0, so that's why I, I didn't switch it just before the talk. Uh, if you want to see how it compares to Akka streams, uh, there is a blog uh, post series I wrote. Uh, there will be a link at the end as well, so you, you can see on the same example how, how, how you can do it with Akka streams and with Monix. 
Uh, at Software Wheel, we're issuing Scala Times. If you haven't heard about it, this is a Scala newsletter with only like interesting articles about Scala, no marketing, no, no j j just good stuff. So please subscribe if you haven't already. And that's all I had. Under the QR code and under the link, you have all the all the materials. There are links to the source code, links to uh, to Monix, and everything you can need. Uh, if you have any questions, you can ask now. You can ask me later. I'm here until the end of the conference. So thank you for your attention.